Theoretical and practical questions of the non-invasive measurement of arterial stiffness. Part 2. Parameters used to describe arterial function, arterial stiffness. The most frequently used parameters in the medical scientific literature for describing arterial function, arterial stiffness are the aortic pulse velocity, the augmentation index, and the central systolic blood pressure and central pulse pressure. The aortic pulse velocity is mainly and primarily related to the aortic wall characteristics. Basically, the stiffer, I would say, the more rigid the aortic wall, the faster the aortic pulse wave velocity. The next index is the augmentation index. This can be measured on the aorta, on the carotid artery, and then the brachial artery or radial artery, whenever we want. However, the augmentation index is basically differs from the aortic pulse velocity because the augmentation index is not a stiffness parameter. It's not directly related to the aortic wall characteristics. The aortic augmentation index is mainly related to the endothelial function maintained vascular resistance, vascular tone of the arterioles and small arteries. And the third very commonly used parameter to describe the arterial function is the central aortic systolic blood pressure and the central pass pressure. The central systolic blood pressure and pass pressure is basically determined by the systemic arterial pressure. However, it is very much influenced by the so-called wave reflection, systolic wave reflection, and it is actually related to the augmentation index as well, because the augmentation index is basically based on the aortic wave reflection in the second part of the systole. Let's talk more detailed about the aortic pass velocity. The aortic pass velocity is well known as a predictor of the cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. The very first data came from the end-stage renal disease trials, where nicely was pointed out that the increased aortic pulse velocity predicts the cardiovascular mortality. Here in this picture, we can see that if the aortic pulse velocity is high, in this case more than 12 meters per second, almost all of the patients died by the end of the follow-up. If the aortic pass velocity turned to be normal or low, less than 9.7 meters per second, almost all of the patients survived the uh, follow-up period. Look at, is this kind of relationship exist in the brachial artery and in the femoral artery? either. No. If we measure the pass velocity on the brachial artery or on the femoral artery, we cannot see such kind of relationship which says that the higher the pass velocity, the poorer the cardiovascular survival. So, mostly the aortic pass velocity is used in the scientific literature to describe the relationship between the increased pulse velocity and the cardiovascular adverse outcome. Indeed, we have several papers confirming this formerly mentioned uh, relationship because in this uh, paper in the hypertension published a couple of years ago, the aortic pulse velocity was uh, assessed uh, regarding the presence of the coronary artery calcium assessed by uh, magnetic resonance. And the 
conclusion was that the aortic pass velocity was related to the subclinical coronary atherosclerosis independently from the conventional risk factors, including blood pressure indices, and was concluded that it could be a good biomarker of cardiovascular risk in asymptomatic individuals. In the Rotterdam study, in more elderly population, in more than 2,800 subjects, the arterial stiffness, aortic pass velocity was measured and was studied the relationship between the risk of coronary heart disease and stroke. And the results proved that the increased aortic pass velocity turned to be an independent predictor of coronary heart disease and stroke in apparently healthy subjects. This kind of relationship, which I mentioned before, was proven even in general population. In the very nice paper published in 2006 in the circulation by Tan Willem Hansen, it was shown that the aortic pulse velocity turned to be a very good marker and index for revealing the adverse cardiac outcome, a composite cardiovascular outcome, and this uh, relationship was above and beyond traditional risk factors, including even 24-hour mean arterial pressure. The importance of this paper is that this kind of strong prognostic value between the aortic pass velocity and the adverse cardiac outcome was proven in general population. The augmentation index. We can see the formula of the augmentation index uh, here in this slide. P2 is the second systolic wave, can be seen here. P1 is the first direct systolic wave called forward systolic wave, and the P2 is the reflected backward systolic wave. So the amplitude of P2 minus the amplitude of the direct P1 divided by the pass pressure and multiplied with 100 gives the augmentation index. Obviously, the lower the P2 is the lower the augmentation index. The higher the P2 is the higher the augmentation index. And then this index, the augmentation index, is primarily related, as I have said, with the peripheral vascular resistance and the small arteries and arterioles. In abnormal case, in case of increased peripheral vascular resistance and tone, the amplitude of the second reflected systolic wave, the P2, is increased, like we can see in this picture. The elevated systolic, second systolic wave amplitude causes an increase in the augmentation index, which nicely reflects to the increased peripheral vascular resistance and the increased uh, and impaired endothelial function. It was pointed out that the augmentation index and the augmented pressure, which is the difference between P1 and P2 amplitudes, is related to the coronary artery disease risk. The higher was the augmentation index, the higher was the risk for the coronary artery disease. This was presented in a nice paper in the circulation in 2004 by Thomas Weber. In this slide, invasively recorded aortic part pressure waveforms can be seen. In case of normal situation, a normal subject, control subject, and in case of coronary artery disease subjects. It can be recognized clearly how big difference exists between the second systolic wave reflection amplitude in case of coronary artery disease and in case of normal control subjects. This kind of invasively recorded changes 
can be repeated with very, very high accuracy with the oscillometric re recorded pressure wave. Here you can see the normal subject, which second systolic wave shown by the red arrow is much lower than the first direct systolic wave, representing the normal augmentation index, which in this case was 24.8%. In the coronary artery disease subjects, the second systolic wave amplitude exceeded the first one for the first systolic wave and resulted an increase in the augmentation index, which was basically doubled. It turned to be 49.7%. This is very nice to see that the invasively recorded and the non-invasively oxymetrically recorded past pressure waveforms were almost identical. Talking about the importance of the uh, augmentation index and the augmentation uh, pressure, which is the difference between the first and second systolic wave, we can say that the higher the reflected augmented pressure is the higher the cardiac afterload. So in the cardiac afterload, either in the systolic vascular resistance, systematic vascular resistance, and the reflected augmented pressure plays fundamental role. So concluding that the increased augmentation index is basically equivalent to the increased cardiac afterload. In other terms, the higher the augmentation index, the higher work should be done by the left ventricle. The third parameter, the central aortic systolic blood pressure. In this picture, we can see the behavior of the pressure in the arterial tree beginning from the aortic root towards to the periphery. We can see that basically the mean arterial pressure and the diastolic pressure just very gentle change will show. However, the systolic blood pressure tends to increase as we are going from the aorta to the peripheral arteries. The sharpest drop can be seen at the arterial level, and if we could take a look on the peripheral vascular resistance, we can see a needle at the arterial level. So, we call these vessels, small vessels, small arteries, and arterioles to be the resistance arteries because they provide the highest resistance against the, against the arterial blood flow. And this kind of increase of the systolic blood pressure from the aorta towards to the periphery called physiological pulse pressure amplification. Please be reminded that the aortic systolic blood pressure always lower than the peripheral, for instance, brachial systolic blood pressure. The reason why aortic systolic blood pressure is lower physiologically than the peripheral systolic blood pressure is in the difference between the wall structure of the aorta and the peripheral arteries, basically. The aorta, physiologically, does not contain muscular layer. However, it contains a very thick elastic lamellae, which makes the aorta very flexible, very soft. While in the peripheral muscular type artery, a very thick muscular layer, smooth muscle layer can be found, which makes the peripheral artery much stiffer and uh, less flexible. Thus, opening and dilating a muscular type artery, much bigger pressure is needed than to dilate a very soft and elastic artery, such as the aorta. What about the arterioles? We can see that the lumen and smooth muscle ratio is the lowest in the arterial level. 
These are the smallest arteries which still contain muscle layer. So if we administer to the patient a unit vasopressor agent which makes vasoconstriction, the strongest effect could be seen at the arterial level because this very strong smooth muscle construction will produce a very marked diameter reduction. Consequently, this produces the highest resistance increase and then this is the way why we, why we call the arterioles to be resistance arterioles. In this slide, I would like to show you the effect of the systolic wave reflection on the central systolic blood pressure. Physiologically, the first direct systolic wave is reflected from the lower body as second or late or backward systolic wave. As I said, the amplitude of the reflected systolic wave is determined by the peripheral vascular resistance, and the higher the amplitude, the second systolic wave, the higher the peripheral vascular resistance. In normal physiological situation, physiologically, the central systolic blood pressure at the aorta is normal than the brachial peripheral blood pressure. What will happen in case of increased peripheral vascular resistance, probably due to the endothelial dysfunction? In this case, the second reflected systolic wave amplitude will increase, and then in the aorta, it will exceed the first systolic pressure, and the highest wave pressure will be seen in the aorta as second systolic wave. While this could not be seen in the brachial peripheral artery because the first wave, due to the physiologically increased systolic blood pressure in the periphery, cannot be seen this kind of increase because it is higher, so the highest pressure in the brachial artery will be created by the first wave, while in the aorta it will be created by the second systolic wave. The consequence is that if I wish to measure the central blood pressure at the brachial artery, I cannot do it directly because it will not be detected being the highest level and the highest systolic and the highest pressure is the first wave, and in the aorta still the second one. So in abnormal situation and in increasing peripheral vascular resistance, the second systolic wave tends to increase towards to the peripheral systolic blood pressure, so the pass pressure amplification, I would say the pass pressure difference between the aortic and the brachial one will diminish, so the pass pressure in the aorta is getting to be higher, closing and following the peripheral one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, repeating. What about the effect of the systolic wave reflection on the central systolic blood pressure? As I mentioned, physiologically, the central aortic blood pressure is much lower than the peripheral systolic blood pressure due to the difference of the structure and the characteristics of the aorta and the brachial artery. In normal case, the aorta is very soft. Thus, to increase the diameter, a small pressure is enough and like a balloon it can be blown up by a baby. However, in case if we have a stiffer, I would say more rigid wall in the artery like in the brachial artery containing muscular layer, 
a much bigger pressure is needed to be able to open the uh, diameter and to dilate the diameter. For this reason, the systolic blood pressure in the brachial artery due to the muscular layer, due to the stiffer artery, is higher. What happens if we see an increased augmentation index due to the increased peripheral vascular resistance? In this case, the second reflected systolic wave amplitude will be increased, thus not the first systolic wave, but the second, the reflected one, will, be, will create the highest pressure in the aorta, so this will be the central systolic blood pressure. Can it be measured and be seen in the brachial artery? Unfortunately not, because due to the stiffer artery and due to the higher pressure needed to be able to dilate the brachial artery, this value is much higher than the reflected one. Thus, still the first systolic wave will create the highest pressure in the brachial artery. Although the second one increased, but it cannot be measured because the highest pressure is the first one, and this is what we will measure during the blood pressure measurement. While the pathological process already occurred in the aorta, because despite of the still normal brachial blood pressure being less than 140, we could see the increase in the augmentation index and increase in the central blood pressure in the aorta. Thus, the pathology is going on. However, this could not be detected by the peripheral brachial blood pressure measurement. Nice data we do have confirming the importance and the significance of the measurement of the central aortic blood pressure. In the strong heart study, it was proven that the central pressure more strongly relates to vascular disease and outcome that does brachial pressure. So uh, it was found in this study, in the strong heart study, that the central blood pressure is more strongly related to vascular hypertrophy, extent of atherosclerosis, and cardiovascular events than is brachial blood pressure. Another very important uh, issue why we do have to measure the central systolic blood pressure is that by measuring the central blood pressure, we can differentiate the effects of different drugs on the central hemodynamics. In the CAFE study, which is the sub-study of the ASCO trial, two regimes were administered. One was based in, on beta blockers with atenolol, and then the other was based on the calcium channel blocker amlodipine. Comparing the effect of the different uh, antihypertensive therapy on the central blood pressure, we could see that the brachial blood pressure was equally reduced by both drugs, either in the calcium channel blocker group or in the beta blocker group, and was no significant difference in the effect of the blood pressure lowering of these drugs regarding the brachial blood pressure. However, there were a very significant difference in the central systolic blood pressure lowering effect and the central aortic pass pressure lowering effect between the two groups, because only the amlodipine-based therapy calcium channel blocker-based therapy was able to reduce the central blood pressure, while the atenolol beta blocker-based therapy did not. It highlights the importance of measuring the central blood pressure whenever we are providing antihypertensive treatment to our subjects and patients. In this example, we can see very nicely why so important is the central systolic blood pressure measurement. This case shows a very young subject, 37 years old, and uh, his, cent his systolic blood pressure on the brachial artery was 160 mercury. Obviously, 
everybody suppose that this case should be treated by antihypertensive drugs. However, his central systolic blood pressure was only 138.4 mercury, referring that it is much, much lower and physiological lower. Why? Because his augmentation index, aortic augmentation index, was only 4.7%. And look at the reflected systolic wave. It is extremely low, referring to the excellent endothelial function, referring to the perfect vasodilatation in the resistance arteries, in the arterioles, re resulting that despite of the peripheral blood pressure increased, the central systolic blood pressure is still normal. This is very common case. Many young subjects used to exhibit the elevated systolic, isolated systolic high blood pressure, and very common case that they start, the doctors administer antihypertensive drug unnecessarily. So, summarizing parameters used to describe arterial function, the arterial stiffness. The aortic pulse velocity is basically related to the characteristics of the aortic wall. The stiffer, the more rigid the aortic wall, the higher the pulse velocity. The augmentation index is mainly related to the endothelial function maintained vascular tone, vascular resistance of the small arteries and arterioles. And the central systolic blood pressure and central pulse pressure this parameter is a bit mixture because it is related partly to the systemic arterial pressure and also to the magnitude of the second systolic wave reflection amplitude, basically to the augmentation index. Thank you for your attention.